Christine Deschler, and as chair of the Arlington Finance Committee, I'm calling the October 5th, 2023 meeting to order. Because this is a hybrid meeting, uh, I would want to confirm that um, people can hear me by calling in attendance, and then also I'll go through the scripts, and then we'll get right into the business of the meeting. Um, starting with uh, confirming that people are here. Uh, Members, when I call your name, please answer in the affirmative. Jordan, not here. Shane, not here. Jennifer, uh, just joined. Hi, Jennifer. Sophie, here. Ryan, Carolyn, Rebecca, yes. Josh, here. Grant, here. Charlie, here. John, here. Daryl, here. Annie. Here. Al Jones. Here. Topher. Here. Peggy. Not here. Al Tosti. Here. Dean. Here. And Dave McKenna. Here. And uh, Tara Bradley. Here. All right, let me go through the script. Um, on March 29th, 2023, Governor Healy signed into law a supplemental budget bill, which among other things, extends the temporary provisions of the open meeting law to March 31st, 2025. This further extension allows public bodies to continue holding meetings, meetings remotely without a quorum of the body physically present at a meeting location so long as adequate alternative access to the deliberations of the meeting is provided to the public. Adequate alternative access includes providing public access through Zoom video conferencing, which we are doing tonight. Ensuring public access does not ensure public comment or public participation. This meeting will not feature public comment. Those wishing to provide comments may do so by emailing our executive secretary, Tara Bradley at tbradley at town.arlington.ma.us. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website, unless otherwise noted. I will recognize members wishing to speak um, whose hand is raised by calling upon them. Please hold um, any comments until your name is called. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. And please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Each vote in this meeting will be conducted by roll call. I am going to uh, skip over um, doing the minutes for approval and we'll hopefully take care of those at the end of the meeting. Uh, we have um, the deputy town manager present with us by Zoom and he will talk to us about article 15 of the special, which is um, collective bargaining. And I think everyone should have um, Proposed vote. Does everyone have a copy of the proposed vote? All right, Alex, take it from here. All right, I'll take it from here. So uh, thanks for having me tonight, everyone. Um, Article mm -hmm. 15 of this year's special town meeting uh, considers collective bargaining. Um, the only contract being considered right now is the Arlington Police Patrol Officers Association. Um, formerly known as the Arlington Patrolmen's Association. We had really hoped that we were going to be able to get uh, settled with the ranking officers prior to this uh, town meeting, but we just, it hasn't worked out. Um, it's a really tough negotiating environment right now, and we're, we're, we're dug in. Um, so the status of that remains ongoing. So um, what we're looking to do is transfer $477,000 uh, from the existing salary reserve, uh, and that'll fund the retroactive payments for FY 22, 23, and 24, um, and then increase the uh, police department's budget by $126,909, um, and that, again, is from the existing salary reserve, um, and what that is going to do is um, will give us some runway to uh, run out the hopefully the rest of FY24. Um, there's some variables at play uh, why we're not looking for, um, that's not the total sort of projected amount that we'll, that we'll need for 24, um, but we have a number of vacancies right now that we're carrying in police. 
Um, we've worked with the chief to sort of develop a plan to manage uh, the finances over there. Um, we have a number of folks that are in the academy right now, and when they um, when they are or they're signed up for the academy, when they're actually accepted and start on payroll, will really sort of help determine what, if any, additional funds we may need. And we're going to watch that because they could get in in either the fall, the winter, or the spring um, into the police academy. And so depending on if and when they do, then that will determine if we need um, another smaller transfer from salary reserve to finish out FY24. Um, so those are sort of like the transfers that we're looking for. And what the contract looks like um, is for FY20, Two, um, so we're digging back into the past here, a one and a half percent wage increase on um, sort of their standard uh, contract language that they had previously. Uh, in FY23, a 2% increase um, with additionally some movement in a couple of their steps. Um, that was retroactive to FY23. And then in FY24 is where um, there are some fairly significant changes. Um, and we'll kind of walk through those now. The first being a 4% market adjustment. Um, and this was sort of a, uh, a an outcomes-based negotiation. Um, like our fire department, a lot of you are probably familiar with trying to get our public safety folks into the 72nd percentile. Um, this ultimately will get our, our um, patrol officers just above that. But, um, it, it, you know, in addition, we got some big sort of gets that we really wanted, like body worn cameras being the biggest one. Um, so in addition to that 4% market adjustment, um, there was some movement in some of their steps. Um, and so the, the distance between their second and third step used to be 4.8%. So that was rounded to 5%. Um, and then the distance between steps three and four and four and five was increased um, to 3% from 1% each. Um, and those, those steps are based on years of service with the patrolman's union. Um, and then once the, uh, once we have a full agreement on a body worn camera policy, there will be a 2% wage increase that kicks into the base as well. So, um, this is, uh, you know, we're in a really tough bargaining environment with our officers right now. Um, the creation of the post commission at the state level has um, made policing very different and more expensive in Massachusetts. Uh, we were keenly watching a few of the um, other cities and towns that we compare ourselves to. They were before the JLMC, and we got down we were literally the day of our arbitration. We had the JLMC folks in our building here and we ended up settling at this right sort of at the 11th hour. And so um, this is what we're bringing before you here today and I'd be happy to answer questions. Questions, Annie. So Alex, when you say 72nd percentile, can you put that in context for me? Absolutely. Yeah, what? Sure, sure, that's a great question. The 72nd percentile of uh, what is colloquially known as the town manager 12. Um, and this is a group of 12 cities and towns, really towns that have um, that all are very comparable to Arlington. And so this was a group that has been that we use for all of our compensation um, comparisons uh, sort of across the board in the town. So is 72nd percentile the goal for all of our employees? Well, the 72nd percentile was the goal during this round of negotiations with all of our community safety folks. So um, what started with our fire department then translated okay. into our both of our uh, police unions. So it's not the goal for our employees in general? It's not a stated goal, but it's something that was a stated goal with these negotiations. Do we know where everybody else is? Where like all the other cities and towns are? No, where all the other employees are relative to this this percentile scale. Um, not the exact. We it it took a lot of work to get to figure out exactly what this market looked like for all these different uh the all of the other unions. So we don't have all the comparable data for all of the like other unions. It's tough because. 
we can make a pretty straight line or at least a close to a comparison between like our patrol union and like <clears> one <throat> of the town's patrol unions, but it's a lot harder to do it um, across like our administrative union, for example, because the duties may be a lot different. Um, but we don't have that analysis done for other unions right now. We only have it for uh, both of our police unions for FY22 through 24 and our fire unions from 22 through 24. It, it, it's okay. a lot of work put together. All right, so one more quick follow-up, not something to answer tonight, but I'd love to see the data on this. If I'm hired as a patrol officer and I'm getting raises plus steps through those 10 years, what are my raises every year? Because they're clearly not one and a half, two and two. Can we get that data sent over at some point? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to send it over. I mean, I can, I can I can sort of answer it if you'd like off the cuff, mm -hmm. like be, the, the distance between steps. So steps one, so we have a first year step. Uh, when you move up to the second year, there's a 5% uh, increase in pay. When you move to the third year, you get another 5% increase. And then when you move to the seventh year, that's the next step you take, it's a 3% increase. And when you move to your 10 year step, you get another 3% increase. And that's in addition to the contractual raises? Th those are like, that's how their wage scale functions. So like that's the distance between steps. And then if there was a COLA on top of that, the COLA would be applied. So if there's like a one or 2% COLA, that would go in addition to the steps. Got it. So it works just like the school's work. Yeah, exactly. Yes. It's very similar. Great. Um, well, like I said, answers my question. Thanks. Sure. Alex Jones? Hey, Alex, can you comment anything about the um, body worn camera policy? And what I'm particularly interested in is whether uh, an agreement would require in itself town meeting approval. Would town meeting, and what I'm really asking is, would town meeting uh, ever have the opportunity to say, well, 2% wage increase is a lot of money. It's not worth it. Let's not do it. Or is that um, past that? I think that this would be inclusive of approving, the, ratifying this contract at town meeting. So I don't think that the body-worn camera policy would stand on its own for town meeting's approval. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Dean and then Topher. Um, Alex, so on, when I look at the increases, they are, they're larger than the historic trend that, of increases for patrolmen. Right. Do you attribute that increase larger than average increase? Do you attribute it to, it's a matter unique to policing? Would you say, no, there's some factors in here of, you know, having two and a half years of really high inflation and how you're going to deal with that? Or would you say it's a little of both? Or would you say it's it's something else? I'd say it's it's a little of both. I think it's mostly unique to policing. Uh, and the, the, the creation of the post commission has really changed um, sort of how police are paid in Massachusetts. And especially with our town manager 12, um, we've seen a lot of like uh, big changes in sort of like the, it, when, when we when we say the 72nd percentile, right? We're talking about like the, the top that one of our top patrolmen could earn. Um, and so we were comparing like our, you know, 10 year step with somebody else's like max step, whatever that is. And so, um, we've seen some big changes. What what really kind of um, caught our eye was a week and a half before we were due to go to the JLMC, Brookline uh, was at the JLMC and they were hit with some massive, massive increases, which uh, sort of gave all of us pause. Um, and we really got um, a little more serious about looking to settle at the end um, rather than leaving our fate in someone else's hands. Um, the police have always historically been, uh, ha had very strong negotiations. Um, they are sort of unified across their industry, if that makes sense. So, um, I, I don't know that, I mean, I can guarantee you, we're not going to see these same kinds of increases in all of our other unions, um, which is, you know, for fair or not, that's how it's going to end up shaking out and how it traditionally sort of has 
Um, so police are just in a very strong position. Um, and it's th their uh, world has sort of changed over the last few years. Um, and so this is sort of the, the ripple effect of that. I think that inflation has played a little bit into this, but um, this cake was mostly baked before inflation got really kind of crazy. Okay. Over. Thank you, I'm sure. So Alex, um, on A4, where is the 4% getting funded from? Which of the, is it one of the two tables in the top? You mentioned the first table was the retroactive, which I assume is over one, two, or three. That's right. The second appropriation partly to fund or all to fund the four percent. No, the the um the first so the four percent is being funded partially in the first table and then fully in the second table because it's so we're doing a small retroactive payment for FY twenty four because we're through the first roughly quarter of the year, and so. So that four percent will be applied to the to the time that we've already ran through FY twenty four, and then the remainder of what you see in the bottom table will be applied there, uh, in addition to um, you know the sort of step moves that that they had seen in FY twenty three. Okay. Um, also, um, how does and I notice you've mentioned the retirees in a bunch of these? How does it work with respect to them? Is this just funding? Sure. They may have retired and but they worked some in the period of time. So That's exactly that. true. Yeah. So, so they will see the benefit of, um, so say somebody retired during the middle of FY 23, they would, uh, they would see the benefit of this contract up until their retirement date. And so this is being applied um, only to retirees, not to people who resigned prior to signature of this contract, if that makes sense. Um, next. Um, yeah. What is the rationale or being paid for the body cameras? Um, that it's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and it's something that we wrestled with. Um, and that the rationale is that it creates a um, new working condition for the police officers that they will be sort of um, being, you know, have the ability to be being watched at all times. And so, it's a change in working conditions for them. And that was sort of the argument. Okay. Um, and you also mentioned that the post position commission has made policing more expensive. Is that a similar argument or something different? Uh, man, yeah, post is tough. Um, what this does is it, um, it sort of exposes any discipline that um, any of our officers have had and puts it puts them onto a like a list that's publicly accessible. And so, it also um, opens officers up to not being credentialed to, so they could lose their ability to be a credentialed police officer. And so um, this had probably a bigger impact than anything else on like what we're seeing on the wage increases, at least that's what we think. Um, because anytime somebody is impacted, they, they're um, exposed and could potentially lose their ability to be a to be a sworn officer in the state of Massachusetts. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Charlie and then Al. So Alex, um, what is the dollar impact of this over the five-year plan? I mean, you, you must have looked at that. Yeah, we did look at that. Um, I don't have it right. Just give me a second. I can pull it up. It's a, it was a, it's a 16% is like the max increase that anyone can can see. Um, well, actually here, the, the dollar impact is, it's projected to be about $650,000 probably. Um, over five years. Excuse me, five years, that, that's over the three years of this contract. The three years of the contract. Right. You're looking for a, a forward projection beyond this contract? Um, I don't have that right now. We are looking at, we're getting right back to the table with these folks for our next round of bargaining. Um, they will not be seeing increases unless and until there is a new contract signed. May, may I have a follow-up? Sure. So, so you're saying that the aggregate impact over three years is $650,000, not per year. Right. Right. So, so, so what we're so it's going to be about eighty six thousand dollars for the FY twenty two retro payments, 
about $264,000 for the FY23 payments. And then when we get to FY24, it becomes a little bit more unclear because um, we're not entirely, we're a quarter of the way through the year. We, we've increased our budget by a hundred or we're looking to increase it by $126,000. Um, and so we're not sure exactly what it's going to do to our budget. Um, it sort of depends on if we're able to fill these vacancies, our OT will go down. So it, it, it depends. So this is about ten thousand dollars a year, or ten thousand dollars per individual on on a broad average, spread over three years. Um, it, it's a little less than that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Al Tosti. Uh, yes, thank you, Alex. Um, I missed some of the material up front. So this is a three-year contract. Correct for retroactive from FY 22, 23, and now into FY 24. Okay, so next year we'll have to start it, obviously, start again for the fiscal 25. What are the percentage increases for 22, 23, 24 each of those years? Yeah, it, um, the top possible is it, it's one and a half in FY 22. It's six max in 23 and it's the, the the um it's nine and a half in 24 and we intentionally in a way we intentionally backloaded this contract to fy24 so our retros it would the 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 cost the, the uh union mem the uh appoa folks wouldn't have this retro rippling all the way through the contract that it would be bigger backloaded and so we would see a um like a lighter first two years than fy24 which is going to be a bigger year does that make sense okay so that's the nine and a half is not cumulative that's a nine and a half for fiscal 24 alone right okay now the set you said it's the, we're in the top 77 percent does that mean of the 12 towns that we compare themselves to, we're in the top quarter? Yeah, what that means is, so we're in the we're in the top, like we're around the 74th percentile, right? So when we have these 12 towns, that means that there are three in front of us and eight behind us. Okay. Right. And so where we fall in line. So it's not a, it's not a function of a percentage of what their top pay is, it's where we fall in the in the order. Okay. And finally, what is the status of the body cameras? It's um, negotiation, right? Yeah, uh, deep in negotiations, uh, we have what we believed was agreement in principle, and now it is being um, it's being discussed with our labor attorney and with the union's attorney, um, trying to get that settled. I had heard that they were very close, but um, I don't have any real solid updates. Now, this 2% they're going to get from the body cameras if we come to an agreement, that's not part of the nine and a half. That would be on top of it. That's that's part of the nine and a half. Oh, it is part of the nine and a half. Right. The assumption is that they're going to see that. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the total value, the total percent increase is just over 16% over the three years. And that includes the market adjustment, body cameras, uh, colas, and step increases. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And one more thing, uh, if I may, I forgot to add that this also includes the addition of Juneteenth as a recognized holiday, um, as we've done for all of our unions. Any other questions? Uh, Daryl has a second. Yeah. Daryl. Alex, a long time no see. <laughs> yeah, it's been a few minutes. <laughs> um, you mentioned vacancies. How many vacancies are there? Currently, in the entire department, there are eight vacancies. Um, I don't believe <laughs> they're not all patrol. I think we have five in patrol. Um, um, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, we're, we're looking. So, so we just ran a civil service list. We had 200 <clears throat> names, and we had 10 sign, meaning that they are eligible for interviews, and they'd accept the move. And so then we have to go through an interview process with all those folks. And um so we're anticipating pushing some folks into the academy, but it depends on uh, when they can get into the academy that they would come on to payroll. And so 
the strategy here is to use some of that vacancy space to um, absorb some of this large increase that we're looking at in FY24. Okay, and is there any is there any update on whether the town will pursue um, pulling out of civil service? I don't have an update on that. Um, it was not a part of this negotiation, though. Um, it was okay. not at, at the end. It was not. Um, it was not considered, and so um, not no update right now. Okay. Okay. Hey, thank you, Alex. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? More, more questions on the body worn policy, body worn camera policy. Um, thank you for the presentation, by the way. Um, so we agreed to the wage increase before we agreed to the parameters of a policy. Is that? That's correct. Yeah. Um, for, for, we, we agreed in principle that there would be a policy and that once it was implemented, that a 2% wage increase would take effect. Is there any timeline like, or? No, um, it was it was very quick when the deal was signed and then we ran into some sticking points. Um, and so um, I don't know that there's like a defined timeline right now. Um, it is being actively worked on by both sides, though. Thank you. Yeah. Any other uh, Alex, is there any chance the second union can come to agreement? I mean, there's always a chance. Um, we have been in negotiate, you know, in negotiations with them for some time, and we 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 held a place on this article with the anticipation that we might be able to get there. Um, so I would say there's always a chance, but I wouldn't call it a good chance right now. Okay. Any other questions? The deputy town manager. All right, well, thank you very much, Alex. Yeah, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Good night. Good night. All right, so, uh, Let's take a vote. Is there a motion regarding Article 15? I move that we uh, support the motion, support the uh, motion. Okay. So, any discussion? None? All right, we'll take a vote. Did I hear anybody over there? All right. All right. All in favor of uh, supporting the proposed vote for Article 15, say yes when I call your name. Jordan. Yes. George. Shane. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Sophie. Yes. Brian. Uh, here, Carolyn. Rebecca. Yes. Josh. Yes. Grant. Yes. Charlie. Yes. John. Daryl. Yes. Annie. Yes. Al Jones. Yes. Topher. Yes. Peggy is in here. Al Tosti. Yes. Dean. Yes. Dave. Yes. All right. Look at that. Passes unanimously. Um, the other finance article is Article 2, which we already covered when we voted to support the um, override in the select board's commitment. So we've done that. So um, that is the end of the finance articles. Now, what is left to the special are zoning articles. And I know that some people want to talk about the zoning article tonight. Um, and so we'll have that discussion, but few things I want to cover before. Um, first of all, I want to read an excerpt of our bylaws, put everything in perspective. So according to the town bylaws, the finance committee shall consider all articles contained in any warrant except articles on zoning and those articles which do not require a request an appropriation of money. The bylaw goes on to say, nothing contained in this section shall preclude the committee from considering, if it sees fit, articles which do not require or request an appropriation of money. 
I interpret that to say, while we can opine on anything, and you should be cautious about treading into zoning articles or articles that don't clearly have a financial impact on the town. I think as a matter of policy, we should also be careful of just that. However, we'll just talk about that tonight. But I see that there are two steps to, that we have to go through. One, whether to wade in. And secondly, if we do, what does that mean? So um, I know Charlie has a presentation. I know Annie, you have a, a, re, a report, a retort to that. Yes. So I'll let Charlie go first and then Annie, and then I'll open it up to the rest of the members. But a couple of ground rules. Keep your comments to finance. That is the only job we do here is make recommendations to town meeting about financial matters. What we want to hear tonight is what, what these zoning articles may, how these zoning articles may impact the town's finance. It's not whether it will solve the housing crisis or not. It's not whether it will lead to a more diverse or less diverse population. It's not about whether it will solve the, um, or worsen climate change. It's about the finances, the town. Um, this may be one of those issues where you could take one vote as a finance committee member and then vote the other way at town or vice versa. Yeah. It's um, when tonight you have to keep your finance committee happy. And I know some people are very passionate about these issues. Um, but your job tonight is as a finance committee. And if you are so passionate about these issues that you don't think you can do your job as a finance committee member, you might want to think about recusing yourself. Um, all right, with that, Dan, you have your hand up? I just have a quick question. Given that you read us the bylaw, you're not interpreting that bylaw as saying that we cannot vote. Can you still speak up a little bit, Annie, please? You are not interpreting the bylaw about our voting as indicating that we are not to vote on zoning articles. I my interpretation of that article is that we can we can opine on anything we want. Okay. But my interpretation is that we should be cautious about waiting in on zoning matters because that the redevelopment board reports to town meeting on those matters. So then when we talk about opining, do you mean providing a note in our report or do you mean taking a vote? I, I don't know how the discussion will, where we're gonna go tonight. So I just want, I just cited the bylaw so people keep that in mind during tonight's discussion. So can you reread the bylaw just one more time? Sure. This is Article 7 of the Town's Bylaw under Section 4, Duties. Um, I'll read the whole thing this time. The committee shall consider all articles contained in any warrant, except articles on zoning upon which the zoning bylaw requires a report to be made to the Town by the Planning Board, and those articles which do not require or request an appropriation of money, which articles shall be considered and a report made to the town by the select board. Said committee shall make recommendations and shall report in print if possible at or prior to each town meeting, but the omission of said committees so to consider, recommend, and or report shall not affect the validity of any vote or other action at any town meeting. The committee shall also make such general suggestions, criticisms, and recommendations as it may deem speedy. Nothing contained in this section shall preclude the committee from considering, if it sees fit, articles which do not require or request an appropriation of money. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I just mentioned one thing, and it, it, it's personal. My, my wife kept bringing this up over and over again, saying at town meeting, when the finance committee, when someone asks if the finance committee has analyzed the financial impact, 
if we say no, we're going to look really stupid. Just offering that as an opinion. All right. So Charlie, then Charlie, then Annie, and then we'll open it up for comments, questions, discussion, debate. Rebecca, do you have a question? I have a procedural question, I think. Um, would you entertain a motion at some point to table the discussion until we had a representative at your discretion, either someone from the ARB or a member of the uh, planning department staff to clarify some of the questions about what's actually contained in the report? I'm a little bit anticipating the presentations, having seen them, but I'm concerned that there's disagreement about what, what the report says. And would it be appropriate for us to wait until we had what are you talking about? The um, ARB's recommended vote for Tom May. Yes, I'll 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 entertain a motion and if it passes, it passes. So, and that would happen later after the presentations if I chose to. I'd like to have the presentations and then open it up to some discussion and then whatever motions people want to make or or not. Thank you. All right, Charlie. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering, uh, can somebody advise me as to how I can get to There should be a green share screen button. Oh, yeah. And then you can share your whole screen or you can just share your whichever window you have. I see the window. So I want to want to share. So go back to Zoom. Make sense of that. Actually, oh, go to basic. Go to basic. There we go. And then you want. No, so Do you oh, want to show all whatever, whatever. Show all. Okay, you have a lot of stuff. Go. Yeah, you have a lot of stuff open. Okay. okay. And then um and then share. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. So uh, let me preface this by saying that uh, um, both Topher and Alan raised some questions about the cost of the um, proposed. I don't. I, the the MB, I just. I'll just say the MBTA Communities Act. Uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, there's so much going on there. It's hard to describe. What um, what any one recommendation is going to be. So uh, I set about looking at this working working with uh, Alan and Topher uh, to try to understand what drives um, what the financial impact of quote unquote expanding the housing capacity might be, and. Um, So um, I'm, I'm, I'm not expressing here any, uh, any opinions about any aspect of the discussion, except what I perceive as what happens if you expand the housing capacity and increase population in Arlington and, and therefore increase the population density in Arlington. Um, so I have some thoughts here about a background, how how I went about it, how we went about analyzing it, what resources we used, and then trying to relate this to our current revenue raising scheme in Arlington. Now, one of the things that we know about this MBTA community law is that if you change the housing capacity, and I'm speaking here as a layman, not as somebody who's you know, terribly intimate with the intricacies of zoning, but we don't know when this impact is going to take place. We don't know when, when, if, or ever there would be any housing expanded. I mean, this is, these are variables and various people have expressed various opinions. So my approach has been to say, okay, let's assume that this takes 20 years, but let's, let's just call the end point, which is the maximum capacity which gets expanded 
let's roll that back to tomorrow and say, what's the difference between today and tomorrow with that capacity built out? And what does it mean to our current finances? With the implication that, you know, prices go up, salaries go up, housing costs go up, all of that stuff just rolls along and that'll play itself out in the future. But this gives us a glimpse of what it would mean if we had this event happen tomorrow, okay? I also uh, want to introduce or you know expand upon the idea of municipal expense elasticity, and we are we are long familiar with that in Arlington because we deal with it every year with Arlington Public Schools. If we have one more student in Arlington Public Schools, we increase the budget by fifty percent of the prior year's standard cost according to DESE. So. That's a, that is a budget that has elasticity with respect to population, meaning the students, the users of the service, of 50%. So there's, if, the, if the school department is elastic with demand, there's no reason not to assume that other departments are elastic also. But they, they're going to vary. Um, and then... Uh, so I'm trying to say, how do we make a comparison of the impact of housing capacity, elasticity, taxation, revenues, et cetera? And our taxes are, we always talk about taxes on a parcel of land. And of course, in the community, we don't deliver services based on parcels of land. We deliver services based on heads, people, head count, students in school, you know, uh, seniors who need support, et cetera. So the municipal expenses vary on a per capita basis. So what I've tried to do uh, with the help of, of Topher and, and Alan, who are tough partners, um, is to understand the how, how, how revenues roll out on a per capita basis versus how expenses roll out on a per capita basis. Um, so this uh, document was developed over some time and, you know, um, it's, it's hard to get your head around what exactly is being proposed. And I think Rebecca raised a good question. We don't know exactly what's being proposed, but there've been numbers thrown around that, that uh, one meeting I went to in July said, suggested a 50 or more percent increase in the housing stock in Arlington. Um, so, you know, how do we... What we needed, I thought, was a model to address this. So um, it's a long-term issue, but I've explained that I'm hoping we can all mentally sort of roll it back to the difference between today and tomorrow um, and use as much of our financial and demographic information that we have to understand how population density and elasticity will affect the town's finances should capacity, housing capacity, be increased. Um, this is a list of different resources that I've used to try to understand the problems. Um, I mean, this is just a small, the open literature is just a small sample. There's hundreds of websites and stuff. One of the most informative is a uh, population growth density and costs of providing public services paper written in 1992 by uh, Professor Helen Ladd at uh, Duke, I think it's Duke University, and I actually corresponded with her. Um, and it, it seems even th those years, way back then, they understood that um, municipal services were elastic with population. And then on the left-hand side, are just different databases in Arlington or in the DOR, a municipal data bank, et cetera, that have uh, resources that apply for this in, or in, used in this analysis. And, and by the way, I have all of these on a website uh, in a, a folder, which I can share if people are interested. Okay, we talked about Helen Lynn. Um, so uh, what we did is look at all of the different uh, parcels and what the categories are. This first chart is just a 
parcel count versus uh, total valuation of the parcels in Arlington. And there are actually one or two small parts, small, uh, one or two incidents way out on the right hand side, get commercial parcels or whatever. Um, but the top box shows the mean parcel valuation for the different categories of, of um, housing, basically, um, on a per parcel basis. And it also shows the average tax revenue per parcel. And, and my point is that it's very hard to understand these numbers with respect to the cost on a per capita population basis. So the bottom box shows the, um, the valuation by household, and then using the reported standard, the reported number of 2.38 people, and by the way, you can look in five different databases and you find some different difference in the population of Arlington and some difference in the count of houses, et cetera. So I just picked the one that I, I found, 2.38 individuals per household on the average. So that tells us the average tax revenue per capita from these different classes of, of uh, housing. Um, and I think that the uh, MBTA Communities Act applies to uh, three family mixed use, three family or more uh, density, but I'm, um, as I said, I'm not the expert in that. The box on the right hand side addresses something that for which Annie has sort of very only objected. Um, but it, I think her objections are unfounded. Um, it's, it's what's the cost per capita? What are we spending per capita in, in the town of Arlington? And in the, from the Finance Committee report, you know, the fiscal 24 total expense is $207 million. We also had about $38 million of money defraying those expenses coming in from the state, from the federal government, and also from local receipts. So they weren't really residential taxes. They're, they're, they're just taking the cost off. So our taxes are supporting this $169 million of expense. Now, we, if you go look at the budget, you know, the, the five-year plan and the, the, uh, the overage stabilization fund and everything rolls in and out at, in various ways, but all of those are really tax revenues. So that $169 million is what the taxpayers are paying every or at last year. And and if you do it on a, on a per capita basis, it's thirty almost thirty seven hundred dollars, thirty six seventy three. The other thing that I was gobsmacked by this because I never looked at it before, I never thought about it, and you you can't see it looking at the top box, but at the bottom box you can see that single family taxpayers are paying more than the average cost per capita, and and other other residential uh, households are paying less on a per capita basis. Um, without going into the distribution of, on different buildings and how many people are in them, et cetera. This is just on average. So I'm going to skip all of these other charts, which just show that we actually pulled out the average values and the meaningful data from uh, the various uh, databases. So uh, what does that tell us? Uh, the question is, if we have an average tax revenue per capita that's lower than the average expense, and we start to build out at a higher population density, what does that do to our revenues? And I took an example, like when I was speaking to Dana Mann and to Alex McGee, they were talking about 882 and 887 um, Mass Avenue. And by the way, I think these numbers are, I think the actual tax revenue is 62,000. Uh, but this was a number that was was presented to me in the discussions. But if you take if you take that improvement from the original facilities or buildings that were there to the new one, you see a big jump in tax revenue. However, we we've also increased the population in that building by by uh, you know, there are 29 units, and if it has an average occupancy of 2.38, we've increased the population by 69. If you say, well, what if it's only 1.5? Then we increase it by 44. And then the tax revenue per capita is a, is a number that's much lower than the average expense that we have in Arlington. So my suggestion is 
that while we have created new tax revenue, and and which and that may be a benefit uh, on a very short term basis, if applied over a large number of cases like this uh, planned expansion in capacity, we may not be doing the budget any good. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, I sort of spoke to all of these items before. You can read them, but basically it's different elasticities, elasticities in different departments. So we, um, we created a model. It took the, this is Alan Jones um, Exhibit D or whatever, I can't remember exactly, um, in, in the Finance Committee report last year. And the, and the, it just, this the categories and the first column are the actual numbers for, for the town meeting last year. And then uh, purely um, from a subjective viewpoint of looking at each department, with the one exception of the school department, we came up with elasticity numbers that said, well, you know, maybe the accounting, the controllers department doesn't really need any more staff if you increase the number of people in town, but you know, maybe the police department does, or maybe it's, um, the, the treasurer's department does because you have to put out more tax bills or something to that effect, okay? And by the way, um, I'm, this analysis is totally agnostic as to who's paying those taxes. In other words, a multifamily unit, might the taxes might be paid by the owner of the building and the people who live there might be paying rent. But fundamentally, the people who are renting those units are the source of the revenue that's getting paid to, uh, to, uh, as taxes. So anyway, this model that we did uh, came out to an average elasticity, a weighted average elasticity across all the departments. You see some of them have elasticity numbers, some of them have nothing. So the weighted average elasticity is 42%. Now, since the school department's half the budget, um, and has 50% elasticity, that means that the differences between the average and, and the school department is 8%. That means in, in this model, the rest of the town has an elasticity of about 35 or 36%. Now, you know, if you want to get into an argument over each one of these categories, that's fine. But I would, I'm going to try to argue that this elasticity is real in a lot of different places. So, and one of those is if you look across the cities and towns, and we actually Al, Alan Jones did this. Uh, look, this chart shows the uh, budgets versus population across the 351 cities we have. And it, it, it's not 100% elastic, it's about 1.85 or something like that as the slope. But basically, if you look at the samples that are pulled out on this box down the left hand side, Watertown has a, had a budget of 188 million, according to the BOR, and population of 35,000. So you go to a double that population, and the budget in Framingham is 322 million. If you take Arlington, 45,000, 46,000 population with a $200 million budget, and then you go look at Fall River, which has twice the population, the budget goes up by you know, 175% or something. So, and the charts at the right indicate that this elasticity applies over 351 cities and towns. So um, it doesn't say it doesn't say that the model that we've generated in the previous slide is is 100% correct, but it says the concept of the elasticity is valid. So in this chart. And again, um, you know, Annie in her retort um, had a, a different number. She said um, a, a, a seven percent increase in population, which could be, which would, is not shown here. Um, but when you run the numbers on a, a sample model that we took, okay, this is not necessarily the way it'll play out, but we have no visibility into that. But simply took a thirty-four percent three-family distribution. 33% four to eight units and 33% over eight, over eight units. Those categories using current valuation means. <clears throat> the fact that all of these 
units are producing tax revenues on a per capita basis less than uh, the average cost means that there's going to be a shortfall in the revenues versus expenses. And, and this shows at, at this 42% um, elasticity, it starts, starts at about 4 million and goes to 17 million. If you drop back to um, a 7% increase, there's still a deficit and it's about 1.8 to 1.9 million, which sort of fits with this graph. If you fill something in there, it's 7%. So um, the point that I would like to make unequivocally is that if we increase the density and we increase that number of housing units, we're going to increase our expenses faster than we can increase the budget unless we raise taxes. So um, building more multifamily housing units is not going to solve any deficit problems. It's only going to exacerbate them. So uh, we all see, well, we can skip this. This just says what happens if the elasticity is more than 42%. Obviously, the budget deficits go up. This, this is the side. So, um, so, to, so to wrap this up, um, on a per capita basis and across the general budgets, the per capita revenue is not going is not in these multifamily units. It does not grow as fast um, as the doesn't doesn't solve the deficit problem. Basically, that's the red lines and the blue lines that you see in that chart. And that average cost per capita this year is thirty six seventy three, and these different units just don't meet it. And I also looked at. Um, in addition to the 887 and the 882 Mass Avenue, I also looked at 117 Mass Avenue, and the same result is comes out that, that it's vastly below the necessary contribution to break even. Um, so the conclusion is that whatever we do, and the state's apparently requiring us that we do something, uh, it's going to cost us money. It's not going to make money. And and um, you know, whatever whatever the uh, town meeting wants to do or the finance committee wants to do, I'm just suggesting that we not stick our heads in the sand and believe that we're going to be creating excess revenues when we're actually going to be creating excess deficits. Thank you. Annie. So, unless you really want me to, since my slides are all text, I'm not going to throw them out. But I think you've all seen them. So I will kind of walk you through and try not to just read them to you. I want to start by setting some context for this. So um, I my objection to the analysis these guys did is that it's a forward-looking model and it makes a bunch of assumptions. And I don't agree with some of those assumptions, although I do agree about this question of elasticity, if you can judge the elasticity of particular lines in the budget. I don't agree with their choices about what that elasticity is. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing I'd like to point out is that we could actually produce a model that told us something about what we might be looking at if we passed NZ3C, because the town population has increased by 8% over the last decade. So we could do a backward looking model that said, what was the effect of an 8% increase in population, including student population? on the budget. And I think that if we're going to do an analysis and present it to town meeting, that that would be a more effective analysis because it's based on actual experience, including the construction of many multifamily units. So I want to talk a little bit about capacity because at the very least, if we're going to continue with your model, Charlie, I think you have to adjust your assumptions about the population growth that might occur under MBTAC. So the meeting that you went to in July, where they were tossing around numbers of possibly doubling the number of units in town, was based on a model produced by the state where the, um, uh, the consultant for the project had not filled out all of the parameters. They hadn't put in setbacks, open space parameters, parking parameters, so on and so forth. The working group made a final recommendation that the model said would increase the number of units in the zone 
to 7,000 units from the 2,000 units that were there. So an addition of 5,000 units. So that should be the population number we work with. If we're actually produce a model presents them to the county we work. Except that the ARB then instituted a minimum one unit of parking per unit and that reduces, uh, according to the state's model, the number of units from about 7,000 to about 3,300, subtract the 2,000 units that are already there. And what you get the model telling you is that there might be an additional 1,300 units. If we take the 2.38 number of people that we know was the average per unit, we get 3,094 people. We added more people than that in the last decade, which is why I suggest a backward looking model. So that's a 7% increase in population, which is probably an adjustment that you want to make to your model. Now, the other thing is that I looked at the elasticity on the school budget and it produced this very large number. And so what I did is I went and I looked at how many kids are there in town, how many kids per unit, and I multiplied that by the increase in units. And if all of those units had the same number of students coming into them as we do for the general population. And I think that's a conservative approach because there's always the possibility that someone will, you know, build a multifamily condo, like the building going up to 1021, and somebody decides they're gonna move into that condo, sells a single family household, they may not have kids in the pool, but their single family household that didn't have kids now may have kids. So let's just assume average kids per unit, even on multifamily housing, generally has fewer students. That results in an additional 403 students coming into the APS over whatever that period of time is. And so the number, the dollar number, to cover that increase at the current decimal number would be smaller. And we're using current dollars. I didn't adjust for the fact that that number will go up over time. So I want you all to keep those numbers in mind. Um, and I also, we should keep in mind that the capacity number under MBTAC is coming from a model that says nothing about what's already sitting on the pieces of land that we're talking about. So that you can't really know what's going to get built or even what might possibly get built unless you go look parcel by parcel with a real estate developer and look at what the potential is. Those parcels include buildings that are so tall and so large that it would be financial suicide to knock them down and build what's allowed under MBTAC. Okay, so per capita expenses. I calculated the per capita expenses slightly differently because we don't actually take, we can't actually take the school population and spread it out across per capita. Yes, that's how the expenses go, but that's not how the service demand rises. The service demand for school rises per student. And so if you're just looking at town services, the per capita costs per person is $1,745 which changes, I think, the picture of how big the gap is between single family capacity and the, the amount of revenue being produced by all of those multifamily units. <laughs> um, yes, and we should also keep in mind that we have 221 fewer kids in elementary schools right now than we did in 2019. We're actually on the ebb of the ebb and flow. Another reason to do the look back look is that it covers an increase and in beginning decrease in student population that we have experienced because our student population ebbs and flows according to generational moves, right? And not according to how much housing we're building. How, obviously housing affects it, but the kids that caused us to have an enrollment crisis to redistrict and to add rooms to elementary schools in the middle of the last decade didn't move into multifamily housing they moved into two family condos in East Arlington because there had been an aging population there and it turned over rather rapidly. And because of how the real estate market and market worked, those that housing became attractive to families with children. Okay, so 882 and 887 Mass Ave. I just want to suggest that the capacity number 44 it is probably not really what we're talking about. 22 of those units are studio apartments and only one of them is a two bedroom. So I set the head count there at 30. 
which puts the amount of uh, income coming in per capita at $1,667, not $1,449. Uh, and then I made some smart remarks about how that's really a commercial property. So another reason that I think we should do the look back is that we can't even accurately model our budget out by years. Our budget models, numbers for the out years change every year. Whatever the five-year plan says, this is what, FY24, whatever it currently says are our costs and our revenue in 2029. We know that by the time we get to FY2029, all those numbers will have changed. That's been our experience with this model for the last almost 20 years now. And part of the reason it changes is because of new growth. So I just think, look back, better idea. Yes, I was upset by the use of the word subsidizing when it comes to who lives in what and how much taxes they are paying. We pay taxes according to the value of the property that we own. We don't purchase a bundle of services. Some of us use very few town services, even though we're paying taxes on a single family home. And some of us use a lot. Alan never had kids in school. He's never used as much service capacity <coughs> as I did with two kids going to the APS. Yeah. Even though we both live in single family homes and pay high taxes, it's probably higher than mine. Let me finish. No, I'm feeling no, but that's, a, that's not a financial one. Yeah. Tara, Tara. Ah. Go ahead, Annie, finish. Let me finish. Okay. So, um, so I think if we're, I, I personally don't think we should weigh in on zoning articles in the sense of taking a vote on a position. I don't think we should vote whether or not any particular zoning article should be passed. And if we want to make a statement, then I think we need to have a consensus about what the model is that we're using. And I would hope that you would all understand why I think a look back at the last 10 years, where we have both experience of how our budget grew and how our population grew, feed the, the data model we construct is the appropriate way to look at things. Um, and so I am with Rebecca that I think that we should delay this discussion until we can build something we can all agree is the right way to look at the problem. Um, I'm sure I had something else to say, but Charlie threw me for a loop, so. Um, well, if you think of it, I'll, I'll the raise my hand. hand. So, um, Al. Oh, I know what it was, Chris. Go ahead. So I did do one little piece of analysis that I think speaks to this issue of elasticity, which is that I went and I looked at how many patrol staff we had in 2002, which is far back as I could go, 2010 and 2020, and compared it to population. And in 2002, we had 47 patrol officers. That was one for every 902 residents. In 2010, we had 43 patrol officers, and that was one for every 996 residents. And currently, or in 2020, we had 49 patrol officers for for a population of 46,308, and that's 945 uh, residents per patrol officer. So the question that I have is, if we're seeing service capacity required by per capita numbers, then what is the correct number of patrol officers per capita to provide consistent services to the residents of Arlington and why don't we do that budget analysis for all of our budget lines? End of speech. Alex Jones and Dean. Um, I just wanted to, during this exercise, um, I had sort of a Don Bricks on Marblehead moment um, that maybe said, well, this, the result the model shows shouldn't really be a surprise at all. Um, the objective of the MET Community Act is to increase housing. And since we have very little undeveloped space, it means increasing population density. And I think we can all agree that our property tax revenue is largely proportional to the occupied square footage. It's just the taxable properties and you know, residential properties are, are, are the bulk of it. On the other hand, the cost of being Arlington increases to a great extent with the population. So then, you know, revenues are being determined by how much 
space we have that's occupied and the cost is by how many people live in that space. And, you know, it just sort of, you know, I think we can all agree that um, increasing the population density increases the ratio of people occupied space. And to fill that gap, the only way to do that is for per capita taxation to increase. Um, and, you know, what I, what I, would like to counter individually or possibly as a finance committee. There, there's a notion being proposed out there by unnamed people that somehow MBTA communities will help uh, reduce our structural deficit. And I think what comes out of just simple understanding of the dynamics is that it, it won't help. It'll actually make our structural deficit worse. So regardless of all the nitty gritties of elasticity and stuff, if we can agree expenses increase with population, revenues increase with occupied space, it just sort of falls out of that. It's pretty, you know, there are a lot of different ratios and, and factors in there, but yeah, I think that, that just a basic rule. It's arithmetic. Mm -hmm. So first I want to thank Amy and Charlie for their um, presentations. I do think, um, I think they're both highly informative. Um, you know, I guess the tact I'm going to take Right now, I'm going to sort of start by referring to those last sentence of our second paragraph of our duties as a committee. Right, as Christine wrote, it says the committee shall also make such general suggestions, criticism, and recommendations as it may deem expedient. Right, so I guess I get to make a criticism, suggestion, or recommendation. Um, my criticism is, um, you know, I think as, as both Dan and Charlie pointed out, this is a seismic shift, right, in, in, in the operation of general substance of the town without a fully thought out product from the town on what the ripples look like. Okay, as, as somebody who I think sat through um, countless school enrollment meetings to talk about expanding buildings and building buildings and replanning buildings, I didn't like any of them. Like, I didn't want to be in any of those meetings. I don't think any of the parents who sat there wanted to be in them. But yet, we don't know what the impact, what are we going to do if 500 kids show up? 400. 400, 400 kids show up, what are we going to do? We don't know. Put our head in the sand, right? Um, and what are the answers for incremental services? Right? I mean, I thank Charlie for doing the work. Thank you for doing the work. But I don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't think the finance committee we should stand behind that. Like, I think the town should do the work. It's the town's job to do it. It's like Annie said, it's the town's job to go back and do the work. Like, it's not the town's job to, play. it's like that stupid game that we play in government, right? Where it's like you walk into, like you you're, you you want to go talk to someone at the town of Arlington, so you walk into the treasurer's office and ask a question about your assessment. And they're like, oh, that's not treasury, that's assessment, right? So you go to the assessor's office. Like, well, that's really this department. It's like, no, no, I just need to talk to someone from the town. You're all from the town. Right. And so what we're doing here is we're kind of playing like this might want to wrap the criticism part. We're playing the same game, right? Well, well, we're the ARP. We're not we're in charge of the budget. And well, the working group, even though they were appointed, I think, by the select board, well, select board can't control stuff dealing with other stuff. So don't worry about it. And I don't think that's I don't think that's a good way to do things. I don't think it's a good thing to say, well, we'll we'll deal with this and we won't. Do any real modeling? We'll just throw it in front of you. <clears throat> so my suggestion to the town is, um, they need to get off their butt and, and explain to us how this is all going to work out. How is it going to work out in terms of students and and police services and fire services and capital and and this and that and and, and kind of you know put a, put a line in the sand. And, and they're not. And I think that that is it's problematic to to you know, sort of steam forward with a, a request to make a change this big without doing all your homework behind it. So that, that's my two cents. Any other, Rebecca? Um, thank you. So what I'm concerned about, I think I alluded to earlier, is that if, if, if we want to discuss this, we have to start with the facts from which we do the analysis, which I appreciate both of these presentations for people really getting into the weeds. But, and then we add our own opinions and values and come up with recommendations. But if we don't 
have a very clear sense for the facts in the recommendation from the ARB. I think it really, you know, models our recommendation. So my understanding, I was only present for the beginning of the ARB meeting the other night, but my understanding of the vote at the end was that the capacity that they're talking about is something like 3,500 on land that currently has 2,000 units. So an additional capacity is something like 1,500, which is very different from an increased capacity of 15,000 minus the 2,000 that are there. So I, I feel like we need to have a good consensus and perhaps that requires a statement from, from someone who put this together about whether we're talking about 1,500 more units or 13,000 more units because wherever you fall on this, that's, you know, a factor of 10 is a huge difference whether you're in favor of it or not. Um, one additional thing I would say, my understanding of the capacity calculation is that the capacity is based on uh, each unit having a thousand square feet. Um, and I think it's not likely that a thousand units, which each have a thousand square feet, would add 400 kids to the schools. I think, so you're either talking about larger units that you put kids in, um, in which case you have fewer units, or most people in Arlington who live in thousand square foot units do not have kids in their house. But, but that would be a fantastic thing to ask the school department. Where do the kids live? Do they live in multifamily units uh, with a thousand square feet? So um, that's where I stand. I, I would like a consensus at least in the in the committee about how many units we're talking about before we start thinking about a position. Thank you. Committee meeting the ARB. Uh, well, I think first in this room, do we do we have a consent? Do we have a, the same understanding about what the increased capacity is? Because I, I think some of the concerns would be alleviated. It sounds like what Charlie's suggesting is we want sort of minimum compliance. And my understanding from the ARB is they're very close to minimum compliance right now. Um, so if we all understood that, then then maybe we're all kind of on the same page. Jennifer, thank you. Yeah. Jennifer? Hi, thanks. Um, so I was on the school committee during the beginning of COVID, and one of the big frustrations that everyone had is that we couldn't give them a plan. We couldn't tell them what was going to happen. <laughs> and and it was, and I think this feels very similar to me. Um, we have a tremendous amount of unknowns. Um, we know, you know, costs for the town do not go up just because we add a person. It has a lot to do with what kind, where that person's living, whether that person has kids. Um, when we added, uh, you know, units in Brigham, we had a lot more kids. And when we added um, 365 or 360, we had virtually no kids, right? So so the the amount of tax revenues that we got didn't cut, you know, in 360, like way outpaced the amount, the extra cost for the town. And in Brigham's, maybe it, it equaled out or something. So um, I, I think we're talking about, I think the reason that nobody can produce a model that everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, now we know what's going to happen is that there's just a lot of uncertainty. So we don't know who wants to sell their property. Uh, people sell their property for family reasons, not just because the value of their house goes up. I mean, my house has doubled and I haven't sold because of that. I'm you know, I'm going to sell when I'm too old to climb the stairs. Um, we don't know, since 177 communities are doing this, we don't know what the demand is in Arlington relative to other communities. So because we're not alone in increasing capacity, uh, it might be that other communities are more attractive than we are uh, for a builder to build in. Um, we don't know what kind of units, you know, are they going to be small studios or are they going to be larger units? Um, we, you know, there's some evidence that multifamily housing produces few kids, but that's usually because they're smaller. Could be that the demand in Arlington is for very large units and then we get a lot of kids. It could be that the kind of buildings that are built have dumpsters and that costs a lot. Could be that they don't have dumpsters. So, I understand the need for some kind of analysis and certainty, but I just don't think we're going to get it. Um, I would recommend that we that the finance committee not take a position. I think there's been other things that have affected revenue and expenses in town, like local option taxes or marijuana dispensaries, or um, certainly the mixed use things that we've passed um, in zoning before that we haven't taken a position on. Um, 
I, in fact, I was explicitly told that we don't take positions on revenue assumptions. We just take positions on budgets. So, so that's my basic thing. I think we have a tremendous amount of uncertainty and that's why we can't get sort of, which is frustrating for most of the town. And also that this just isn't the kind of thing that the finance committee has, as far as I understand it, and obviously I've been on for a very short bit, um, but has taken a position on in the past. Okay, so um, Topher first, then Jordan, and then Charlie for a second. Al Tosti. So Topher, Jordan, Al. All right, thank you. So just a few comments here um, on the ARV adjustments. Uh, you stuck it out to the end. Congratulations. Um, but um, another thing was they took neighborhoods down to three stories. Um, they did a bunch of stuff in East Arlington. I don't think we have a final map yet, but I would agree the capacity is going to be less. But I would also say the model we built, the, the, the thing was, yes, it would be worse if it was a larger capacity. But the basic point was, you know, was basically that this does not seem to be helping the budget and is probably going to make it worse. And as far as whether we weigh in or not, town meeting members have been going and asking, where's the fine? What is the financial impact? What's the finance committee think about this? And there have been people weighing in saying stuff that, oh no, it'll be fine. It'll be great. You know, we, we can do this. So, you know, in some sense, there's already a recommendation out there. I think we have to decide whether we agree with it. Um, and I think people are looking to us for it. So if we do say we don't take a position on this, then I think we also have to say precisely why. And I do think that will disappoint some town meeting members who are looking for guidance. Uh, as far as, um, you know, and the model itself, like I said, is population kind of agnostic in terms of how much it is, it's a bit larger. And yes, we can get into um, the questions of, you know, the, the, the details. But um, I wanted, I want to believe that it would fit. I do want to, I want to believe that this sort of thing would fix and help our budget. I would like to find something that would close this deficit. So, but I, when I saw the numbers, I, I didn't do that. Um, Jordan. Great. So, um, I'll, uh, so I don't want to rehash too much of what's already previously been said. Um, but I will say that I, uh, my opinion on this is I think that it's, um, you know, given our role and what we do in making recommendations, um, as to the budget and whether we approve or dis, uh, or not approve, uh, what the budgets are. I think that that's traditionally been our role. I think, even though this may disappoint some town meeting members, I don't feel like it's appropriate for us to be dealing with hypothetical uh, population growths and what the impact is going to have on the budget. I certainly appreciate uh, the efforts uh, of the two parties that put together um, their projections, but I think at the end of the day, I think, Dean, you sum this up probably the best. We don't, you know, these are projections that we put together and it's really not, it's really outside of what our expertise is and what ultimately our role is. Um, so I just don't feel like it's appropriate for us to be uh, weighing in on hypotheticals. I think that we should focus um, on what we traditionally do in making recommendations on the budget and to not try to uh, try to weigh in on projections for things that are outside of what our expertise is. Um, there are vendors out there who do specialize in what these types of hypotheticals that we're talking about are. If that was something that was desired by the town, then I think it should have been something that town administration should uh, initiate because they do exist. So. Um, without saying much more, uh, that's my position. I don't think that this is something that um, the uh, the finance committee should be taking an official position on. Um, I think it sets a dangerous precedent uh, moving forward um, regarding zoning articles. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Uh, Al Tosti. Yes, I think uh, I'd like to make a couple of points quickly, and then a suggestion. 
Uh, Jennifer mentions the tremendous uncertainty in all this data. You're on mute. You got you muted out. Yourself. You hit your mute button. Something somewhere. Okay. Uh, the disagreements between Charlie and Annie. Uh, both people I, I have tremendous respect for. Uh, there's tremendous unknowns here. To vote this in requires a majority vote. To repeal it requires a two-thirds vote. I think this strongly argues that the Finance Committee could be recommending that we do the minimum. We have to do it anyway. It's 2046 uh, or something in, uh, in that area. We do the minimum. We see how it goes. And then if, if, if the uh, financial impact is not significant, if revenue comes in better, then the town meeting can always move forward and do more. But it certainly argues towards doing the minimum now, which we have to do by state, and then see how it goes. And then we'll have actual numbers rather than projections. So I guess that would be my recommendation uh, that if the finance committee is gonna take a position we argue toward, towards the minimum, see how it goes, and then we can always adjust it later on. Uh, thank you. Um, John. Well, um, I'd also like to thank uh, Carol and Al and uh, Gopher for creating this model, but I, I guess I have concerns about it as well. Um, I think that People do expect kind of a simple answer about what the impact of this policy will be. And I think the model provides a simple answer. You kind of right at the very end, say between 4 million and 15 million or something like that. That's a number that's gonna stick in people's heads very firmly. And I feel that it's not a simple problem and that the model, you're streamlining everything. And I have some, some questions about the model, but I, I think that if FinCom is going to go endorse your model, then we need to have more time to study it and look at the not, you know, the formulas, et cetera. And so it doesn't feel comfortable to me um, to kind of endorse something based on those kind of summary statements. Um, I would also note that we just voted on the police union contract, six hundred thousand dollars. Excuse me, six hundred thousand dollars, which is just through 24, that's gonna have a bigger impact going forward. The override is obviously a, a big policy change that's also gonna have million dollar impact. So we have to kind of keep this all in context of the other big decisions that we make and that we, you know, we think about. I do like Annie's idea to look back. Um, that gives us kind of, you know, I think the most concrete evidence we could look back to when Arlington's population was 60,000 and figure out what the per capita expense was in today's dollars. That might be another interesting piece of information. I don't know, let, let me just ask some specific questions about the model, just to make sure I understand it. In terms of the increased tax revenue, are you taking into consideration like the impact of proposition two and a half and the, the fact that our total basis is moving up? No. No. It's just, a, a, it's a, Snapshot today and tomorrow. In other words, no, but even today and tomorrow, if we build all that out, our basis would move up and we, our revenues would go up more than just the no, assessed no, value. Oh, oh if the base, yeah, the, the, that's taken into account automatically. It is, okay. And the per capita, um, I guess I have a problem with the average per capita being applied across the board. Could we get more exact per capita information from the census information about different? I tried different... to look for that. Um, I, I mean, in, in the time that I had, I just couldn't find um, any uh, geographic breakdown per capita. Mm -hmm. But um, I would note that we had uh, we had to expand both the um, Thompson and the Hardy schools after we rebuilt them. And then that's largely a two-family or more neighborhood. So it seems to me that 
um, we can have children in multifamily housing, you know, that uh, will we'll enter the school system. But I, but that, that's just um, the answer. The answer, simple answer to your question is we didn't have that information. Right. Okay. Um, is um, the the valuation, the relative valuation, is that what, like, what time period is that from, like, the average this single is family? Out of the current database of the assessor. Okay. You know, this is 2023 or 24. Okay. And then I guess the other thing that I think about is like <clears throat> the elastic, elasticity percentages you apply and things like that. That obviously for some things, there's an economy of scale, right? right. And so I'm not sure that I, your average elasticity might, seems high to me, I guess. Um, it's so okay. Two comments here. One is that if you look at the ratio of municipal expense versus population across the straight across the state, okay, it's almost it's a straight line at about a slope of one point eight five. So um, there is somehow in that data a message that municipal expenses are elastic with respect to population, and it's not small. Okay, but the but, but, but the first. Been, in the, in the second case, um, I will be the first to admit that if you put five people in a room, you could come up with five different estimates of what department is elastic or whether it is or not. You know, that's, that, that's very subjective and we have very little objective data on that. However, um, as I mentioned, the, the town has accepted 50% elasticity in the school department. So there must be, a, there is a belief here that municipal services are elastic. And, and just let me finish this one thought. The 42% average elasticity in that model means that the rest of the town outside of the school department has got a, a, an order of a 35% elasticity. It's, you, you know, you can push it down. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not uh, tied to it. And I'm, I'm not tied to the absolute precision of the model. What I am tied to is the, the way it works. You know, the, you know, the population goes up, the costs go up. And that to me is, it's clear. And I, and, and, you know, I did, uh, I did run through Andy's numbers, the 7% and, you know, our school number, Increase the, the dollar increase in the school number from our model came out actually lower than the dollar school the school uh, estimate that Annie made. Right. So, you know, I mean, but I guess my point is that if we look at our expenses next year, assuming that our population remains the same, all of a sudden because of the decisions we're making with the override, our per capita expense is going to go up significantly. Right, five percent, ten percent. No, actually, the way we did this um, is we ex is you're you're right in that in that one year period they're going to go up, but the the number that we use for the per capita expenses were the the operating costs of the town in the entirety, less outside money coming in to pay to defray some of them. Okay, so the so the override. The ups and downs of the override, et cetera, washes through there. This is a this is a, a number that is. Um, I, I think I understand what you're saying. I don't want to cut you off, but our expenses for the school department are going to, in real dollars, are going to be increasing next year. Uh, if if the I override think I, passes, I think I asked the finance committee not to support that last spring. You did, policy. you did, but I'm just saying that. So you might argue that, and then if, if we didn't even know that. And we don't really know what Watertown's doing, and we don't know what Belmont's doing, you know, in terms of their interior stuff. We didn't know that all of a sudden we would say, well, geez, our uncle must have had a big population growth because all of a sudden the expenses went way up because everything's elastic. But that that's not what actually happened. Well, that's so true. Yeah. I, I'm just saying that I think that again, I, I wish that we could just say kind of in a simple way, yes, if we have more people, our expenses go up, and therefore this is going to have an economic impact, whatever we do. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing, you know, because we, we do make choices like that. Sometimes it's worth spending more for some things. I just 
I'm concerned. I wouldn't be comfortable taking a, a vote supporting your model and the, and the summary statement that it's making, I guess. Just because, again, if you shift the assumptions a little bit, you'll come up with a very different number. So I would, if, if, if you're going to do a range that's going to have an impact of a million dollars to eight million dollars or something, I might feel more comfortable with if I, where you come out with a fairly strict number. I just, I, I don't know. Trust, this wasn't an attempt to come out with a strict number. This was an attempt to show that that the general idea of increasing residential housing and reducing deficits are incompatible. In other words, if you increase the dense, the housing density and you build out more housing, you're going to have higher expenses. Well, couldn't you say the opposite though? Again, with the economy of scale, if you lost 20% of our population, then our per capita expenses would probably go up. So I, I don't know how you uh, justify well, actually, that. Actually, in, in the school department, when they the population went down, they reduced the budget. Right, but I, I and I, I don't want to take much time, but I think the the agreement that we made in terms of the school department's budget and the fifty percent growth and all that's that's kind of like a, a you know it was a, it was a model a, a way to approach with a formula what we should be doing for the school budget and it might not have had you know it might not have represented reality it was just an, an agreement that you could have kind of you know come to terms with with the, with the school committee. Josh, that's true of any budget. Yes, but you're trying to predict reality here. You're not. You're. You're not. You're not. Your model is trying to predict the dollars. It's not saying, well, we. You know, I don't know. It's not a budget document. You're. I don't. Well, anyway. Anything else? That's what I have to say. Thanks. You finished? Pardon me. Anything more? No. Thanks. Um, uh, Grant, next. But I have a question. When is the state? If someone has knows the, knows the answer, when is the state demanding that we decide to do this? December 31st, 2024. Except that he would then be ineligible for the fossil fuel ban uh, pilot. We have to make a decision by early November of this year if we want to December participate. December 11th. December 30th, 2024. Yeah. We don't get the carrot if we don't do it this year. Right. And, and how much is the carrot? Well, the carrot isn't money. The carrot is something town meeting voted for overwhelmingly, which is to no longer allow fossil fuel hookups in new construction as a climate change uh, uh, mitigation measure. I'm asking, what do we get by doing this now? We get to participate in that pilot. Which is, what does that provide us? Though? That provides us the right to to say that all new construction must be electric only and not use gas or oil for energy. We don't get a check. Right. Okay. We don't get a That's, check. It's not a dollar. Right. There's no dollar. Right. And so it's December 2024. Yeah. December 31st, 2024 is our hard deadline. If we don't do that, then we get then we get the, the yes. answer. Yes. Can we get the but there's a huge financial component to that. Mm -hmm. But it's November 11th for the fossil fuel demonstration pilot. Fossil fuel demonstration pilot, November 11th. Of uh, next year? This no, year. This year. Of this year. Grant. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for all the analysis and uh, um, but I'm not, I, I'm not, and I thank you for the analysis. I wasn't looking for any strict numbers um, or anything else like that. What I think came out of it was more like a postulate where it's kind of like gravity, right? Things fall. The wind resistance may be different, but things still fall. Um, I'm not certain with all of this. Did we um, more population increases expenses? Is that um, a, is that a shared view uh, with Annie's? Or do you, is it sort of the opposite where? Well, no, it, it won't increase. Them. No, it, it, that is a shared view. Okay. Our argument is about whether I, or not the revenues will keep up. Right. And our argument is also about the variables around elasticity in the model. I understand, and I understand about the assumptions uh, within. And uh, so if we agree that it does increase costs, um, but we, you know, no one knows the number and, you know, that when, but we can take a position that that is um, 
if we agreed on that, we could take that position with no numbers that look more units cost more. Not taking position about, you know, again, that could be up to everyone else, but it is, we could state, make a statement to possibly that, hey, by the way, you know, what goes up must come down, more units cost more money. And it's just a thought that I had that maybe we could, because we never get these numbers are just, you know. Just, so then anyways, that's my suggestion to make it, if we're going to make any position at all, we just make a simple statement. That statement, that simple statement. All right, anyone I haven't heard from? Yep, anyone I haven't, Shane? I have more of a process question. I, I sort of, I keep reading the, the bylaw and I just don't understand. It says articles on zoning upon which the zoning bylaw requires a report to be made to the town by the planning board. Is this a zoning bylaw that requires a report to be made? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. But they, they may or may not include any fiscal analysis. Yeah. Okay. I'm just reading the bylaw about which defines our jurisdiction. Thanks. All right. So now, second time around, Charlie, you had your hand up. Uh, you done? Yes. Okay. Um, Jennifer. Hi. Um, yeah, so I would not be in favor of something that just talked about um, the increase in expenses. I think what the town is interested in is what's the differential. We know that revenue is going to go up. We know that expenses are going to go up. But will revenue go up more than expenses or will expenses go up more than revenue? And it seems to me that that has a lot to do with whether there are kids that come with the new housing, um, which is an unknown. Um, so I, I, I just don't think that we can make an accurate prediction. Uh, I do want to say I've sat in on all the McKibben, you know, discussions and the school committee had a chance to interview him and talked about things. And he was very, very insistent that the single most important factor in whether you have additional kids in the school system is how many 70 year olds you have in a neighborhood, because when you have a bunch of 70 year olds, the especially housing stock that's older and maybe harder to maintain, that's when the housing turns over. And we kept asking him, we said, well, would this help you know, make a difference? And would this thing make a difference? And he was like, absolutely adamant, no. <laughs> you know, so, so the school population and, and the expenses for the town you know, do go up and down based on um, what the population of Arlington looks like. Um, one more point uh, is that one of the things that I've been very impressed with in this town is when you look back and you see that increase in, in 6,000 people over the past what, 10, 15 years, 10, um, 13 years. Um, what? Okay. It's 4,000. 4,000, I'm sorry. 4, um, oh, right. Okay. Well, there was a, right. Okay. There was, we were at 40,000 at one point, but you're right. We were at 42 more recently. Um, so, um, is that actually the town, the town staff has not increased. And that might be because there's some strain and that we don't actually, that we probably need more, more staff than we have. But, you know, the pressure is really from the schools, right? That we've just increased school population, uh, school staff a lot. But we've actually barely increased town staff. Um, and again, that is whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that just sort of very striking when you look back at the budgets. That's it, thanks. Danny? So Charlie, what does your model assume about new growth? New growth in? In the tax levy. It's it's built in. In other words, the the uh, if, if we say that <clears throat> we, we had a 30, 34, 33, 33% distribution of three family, eight, eight, less than eight and more than eight. Okay. So that creates tax revenue for yeah. new growth. It's based on the actual tax level, the number of sample properties, including 882 and 887 or 117. Okay. Yeah, you know, relatively recent all the family bills. Okay. So I must have missed that. So you did build a new growth. Yeah. And that was one of the things I had a question of. Sorry. All right. And then the way that I got to my school dollar amount was by taking the 
$8,800, it was the decimal number, and multiplying it by that headcount that I came up with. That gave me a lower number than the difference. Let me finish. Let me wait, 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 Charlie. Go ahead, finish. That gave me a lower number than the difference between our current school budget or general fund contribution and the number that your elasticity calculated. That's why we came up with a different number. We did it calculated it differently. If I can correct you, Andy. Yes. The the assumption in that first column in, yes. in, the, in the model is a 15% population growth. When you put a 7% population growth in there, the 400 students come out of our model just like they came out of your model. Okay. It's, in other words, it's not has nothing to do with the model with the basic assumption. I get it. I'm just trying to match our assumption. Yeah. So that so okay. the, 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 that's why I said before the our yeah. number was Sorry. a couple hundred bucks lower than your number in terms of the total cost at seven percent. Got it. Um I think that I agree with the folks who are saying that we shouldn't take a position on this. You know, there's never been a zoning article that hasn't affected the budget because zoning articles affect what gets billed and what it's worth and how many people and how many residences are allowable under the zoning bylaw, so on and so forth. We voted to increase, we voted mixed use, which creates multifamily housing. We voted to increase the FAR, which creates multifamily housing. We've, we've taken many such votes in town meeting and the ARB's made many such recommendations without the finance committee ever being asked to analyze the financial impact based on the fact that it was going to produce more multifamily housing. And I don't think we are prepared to do that analysis now. Three weeks ago, I asked Eric Helmuth to ask the town staff to do an analysis. So I don't know where that is, but I did ask for it because it seemed to me like they should do that. I didn't until I did some work with numbers it didn't occur to me that based on population growth over the last 10 years, we could do a look back. So I can go back and suggest to Eric and call the town manager and as an individual citizen and suggest they try to do that look back. But I don't think it's something we can vote on tonight. So I'm with the crew that says that shouldn't be taking a position. Grant, unfortunately, I don't think we can say, well, expenses will go up without saying what happens to revenue. I'm, I'm ready to make a motion to say no position. I, I was just making a suggestion. Yeah, I make a motion. Uh, let, uh, yeah, we <laughs> yeah. got Al. Right. Daryl, did you have your hand up? He does now. <laughs> Go ahead, Daryl. So I, I, I heartily endorse what um, Annie and, and Grant said earlier. I consider myself competent to do a lot of things. Um, uh, deep analysis and, and to be honest, deep understanding of issues like this is not one of my areas of competence. Um, and I don't think it's really within um, our purview as a, as a committee. And I think we would get ourselves in deep, deep trouble getting over our skis as it were. Um, so if somebody's willing to make a motion about um, no action, I'm, I'm more than happy to vote for it. No position. No position. <laughs> I'm motion, no position. All right, do I, is there a motion? Daryl, are you making a motion? I'll, I'll make the position. motion for no position. Second. 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 Uh, Al Tosti. Yeah, <clears throat> just to uh, correct something that was said, the town has increased some staff over the last 10 years, but not as much as the school because the town was willing to take a hit of lower increases because of the uh, increased school population. So there was a reason why the town popul the town uh, employees weren't increasing uh, as much as they might have wanted to. And the second thing I just want to mention is to repeat what I said before. If there's so much indecision, if there's so much we don't know, then then maybe the finance committee should be encouraging to the town meeting to be conservative in how they in how they enter this. Uh, you don't go with the minimum that's required by the state and see how it works. So I, I think that might be a financially responsible position for the finance committee to take. Thank you. Okay. So Al, are you making a motion, another, a different motion that we take the position that the town meeting should go with the most conservative um, option? Yes, 
I think the uh, that we should go with the minimum required by the state because there are so many unknowns. Al, can you formulate the motion? Uh, yes, that the, that the finance committee recommends that the uh, town meeting uh, vote to accept the minimum re uh, required uh, numbers as put forth by the state until further information is, is uh, accumulated. There's a second. Second. Further discussion, Al Jones, then Tipper. Um, I, I recommend, I think it was H.L. Mencken said every complex problem has a simple solution that's wrong. Yeah. But uh, I think in this case, I hope that everybody has understands the arithmetic of the model well enough to know that increased density with increased density, population density, the expenses will rise faster than the increase in revenues. They both have fixed and variable components. But I think you can you can vary things all over the place, and you still end up with a negative slope that says increased density will let's say have a negative impact on the uh, structural deficit. Um, and I want to loop back to what my wife asked, whether or not we take a position. When someone at town meeting stands up and asks, has the finance committee analyzed the financial impact? And the moderator asks our chair, there should be an answer. And it's up to the chair what the answer is, but I think we need to be prepared with that answer. And, and hopefully not say, no, we didn't consider it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk to Alan. Mr. Tosti's motion first. Um, you know, the, the we aren't going to make the recommendation of the minimum, or I mean, the ARB is going to come out with whatever they come out with, and it's going to have some number. Um, I don't think it will be likely to be. <clears throat> depends how you, I guess, quant. It's not likely to be a twenty forty six capacity level. So I don't know. I mean, we can say, I don't know if we want to say that, or we want to say just, you know, a lower number is better. I mean, I think that's where the ARB has been going anyway. Um, I, so I'm a little bit, I'm not sure how we would, how we would vote to say, you know, the ARB should do this. I mean, they're going to come out with whatever they come out with. So, so I'm just not sure how we, how we say, you know, do this number, I think we can say, we think we could say, well, you know, more conservative is better, lower is better. Um, but I, would, I don't know if we can really say the minimum. Uh, so it's quite how we can do that. Um, <clears throat> to the question of whether we take a position or not, I, mean, I understand some of the reticence, the reluctance to do that, given that there's not uniform agreement on what everything is. Um, we could take position that there are too many variables for this to be known, um, but you know, or we can you know kind of take position, and the chair will have to answer the question as well. So, that, um, but you know, there are opinions out there. You know, there are opinions being made by various people, and um, there probably have to be more. And I think part of why we got pulled into this was saying, well, wait, there's these claims being made, but we still think that we can So yeah. that, just keep that in mind. There will be people making individual opinions known. And so that, that'll be there, even if the body does not take a formal position. And I think part of why there, there's been asking to do it for this one is, yeah, there's been a lot of zoning changes, but this is one of the larger ones that we've seen. Um, let me ask you, Annie, do you agree with the statement that increased density will increase expenses faster than revenue? No. I don't agree with that either. And Topher, you have issues with Al Tosti's motion. Do you have substitute or an alternative motion? Um, 
I would say that based on what we've looked at, it is that a lower lower capacity numbers are safer in terms of budgeting time. You want to make a motion or just leave it as is? I'm sure I'll make that substitute. I guess it will be, or if you want me to make it as a separate motion. Make it as a separate motion. Separate motion. Make that motion. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Chair. So your motion is that the Finance Committee recommend to town meeting that they, are, that they. A lower capacity number is financially safer. Okay. Hey, is there a second to that? Sorry. Would that be ready? Um, thank you. Um, so first to the, the questions of either outsourcing motion or this motion that we recommend to a lower capacity number. My understanding is the ARB has a specific proposal that goes in front of town meeting. Now, if anyone chooses to propose an amendment, can we say in advance what amendment we might hypothetically support? That seems a little premature to me. Right now, we have the ARB's proposal as they discussed Tuesday night, which my understanding is they believe they are finished with this article. They yes. posted it for right. That they they think they have their final version. They posted it today. They posted the word for the article today. Okay, so if the if the ARB has their proposal, I guess I think it's sort of unsatisfying to say you know if someone in the future comes up with an amendment, it's possible that that the finance committee might prefer that amendment over over the ARB. I think it's premature to say that. Yeah. Um, well, there are, it is an amendment in the warrant, so it will be. Right. Someone could, but I'm saying someone could make an amendment to make it only 2,000 rather than 3,500. No, but they would have to amend the map. They were a very complicated amendment that involves the map and all sorts of things. So they have parcels, change heights, <laughs> parking requirements. So, all right, all, all that I'm saying is one at a time. One at a time. All I'm saying is that I, I think it's, it's to my mind, it's too complicated for us to say that we would prefer. We prefer something entirely different than what the ARB is proposing because what we have is the ARB proposal. Um, the second thing I would just say is, having been in town meeting, the thing that I find helpful as a town meeting member is when there is a consensus from a committee. Like if the finance committee was like, we are all in favor of this, or even overwhelmingly in favor of this, or overwhelmingly opposed to it, that would be super helpful for a town meeting. But I think that what we're seeing from this meeting is that there's a diversity of opinion and there's also a diversity of conclusions. Um, about how big a deal it would be. And then on top of that, you have the question of, is it worth it if it is a big deal? So to my mind, this isn't the kind of thing that town meeting would find helpful if we have a close vote. I think that they might find it helpful to just know there was a diversity of opinion in the finance committee. And some of the people who have the best prepared presentations are town meeting members who could make those to town or to, to town meeting in general. Or could be invited to town meeting. Um, and maybe that's something the town meeting members need to see for themselves and consider for themselves, given that we don't have some huge consensus. Sophie. So two Madam Chair. Um, uh, Sophie has a chair, has the floor. I'll get to you, Alan. Okay, okay so first, I, first a question and then a comment. The question is does it have to be, uh, does the motion have to be we recommend something or can it be you have an opinion or something lighter than we recommend. Just throwing out, a, I mean, does it have to be a recommendation? No, we have a recommendation, a suggestion, or a criticism. Right, <laughs> so I, I don't like know. I, I, I don't know if, I don't know how I feel about a, a recommendation with that word, but, and then I actually, just a comment, when I was a town meeting member, had the opposite reaction. I always looked for when committees were close in votes because it showed to me that there was in-depth discussion and then I could probe it. And that's when I would go and ask the questions. And I think Al would say, well, if you were interested, you should have met me. <laughs> so I, I yeah. guess I differed. Um, I, I thought it was interesting as a town meeting member to see when there was discussion and that there was something to actually think about versus just rubber stamp. Oh, everybody agreed. So I should just go with it. So. Okay. Al. 
Yeah, I, I didn't hear the last recommendation, but if I could just clarify the wording of what I'd, I'd like to recommend is the finance committee recommends the town meeting that they approve uh, the lowest available number consistent with the requirements of state law. And so whatever, you know, that, that's all we're saying because of the uh, of the confusion and lack of data at this time, we recommend the most conservative or the lowest available number consistent with the requirements of law. And whatever that number is, that's it for them to decide. Topher, do you think that that is what you're going to do? All right. All right. Um, Jordan. So I'm sorry, the current motion is to recommend the minimum number to town meeting. Is that correct? The most conservative option. We have we have a couple of motions so far. One is the what Al Tosti just articulated that the finance committee recommends that town meeting adopt the lowest, most conservative available number consistent with the requirements of state law. Right, and then there's then there is a motion that um, yeah, Daryl's motion, which is that the finance committee take no position on the zoning articles. Okay, so this is currently Al's for recommending the minimum to town meeting, correct? Minimum consistent with state law. Yes, the minimum uh, amount available. If if nobody makes a recommendation or uh, that's lower, then it's the ARB vote. If somebody makes a recommendation with a lower number, then we recommend the lower number consistent with the requirements of law. And Al, I have a question. What if that, that substitute motion has other things attached to it? That I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What if, the, if that, that alternative motion and has other conditions attached to it that we are uncomfortable with or could be uncomfortable with I, you know we, we we can't prepare for every eventuality all we're doing is take is taking the position that we don't know a lot of the data nobody knows the data uh, we have to do the minimum required by law that's a necessity then let's be conservative that's uh, if uh, I, you know, I I don't think there's going to be some some weird changes uh, that's make, going to make it apply to all of Morningside. I think the changes are going to be some maybe what the ARB is going to be, and maybe my guess is that a change that's lower than that. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, Daryl? Um, so I'm having an internal debate about whether to withdraw my motion in favor of Al's. Um, I'm just going to make it What's the, since we're three on the floor from a... Uh, well, yes. Annie just said, Annie just said that if you withdraw your motion, she's going to make the motion. Yep. So I think you, you know. should just let that, let well, your I'm motion stand. No action okay. yeah. All right. Yes. Anyone have any additional motions they want to make? Charlie. Um, Madam Chair, I, I don't have a, an additional motion, but it seems to me that uh, the discussion around Al's motion argues towards uh, being conservative. And in the present, in the uh, analysis that uh, Topher and Alan and I did, at the end of the day, we recommended um, something like that, something that's like sort of the minimum amount that the state pushed forward or whatever. And we've had a, a, a lengthy discussion here about the various financial intricacies of one model versus the other and whether gravity goes up or down. <laughs> and um, I think all, all of it's been somewhat valid. So maybe whatever uh, whatever position the chair is willing to take or has to will take in front of town meeting should be should have the preamble that. Um, Town bylaw uh, advises the finance committee not to make uh, pronouncements on zoning regulations, but that the finance committee has um, 
had extensive discussions about the potential financial implications, doesn't have enough information to come to a conclusion, but recommends conservative action. You know, without maybe so such a strong conservative, but but uh, caution or something. So, are you making a motion that no, the finance? No, no, I'm not. I'm just suggesting a speech that you can give in front of town. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have anything else, Josh? Yeah, um, I guess I, I unfortunately I, I can't support Al's motion. I just have another question of our modelers to my left. <laughs> The, the in the summary in the last slide it says sort of worst case that and it ought that fifteen percent increase happening tomorrow would add four million dollars to the budget, right? Yes. So I think as a town meeting member, if I put that other hat on, there's like a concern, well, oh my God, this is gonna like blow the budget out of the sky. If I take your statement at face value and say, well, that's not gonna happen tomorrow. That's gonna happen maybe over 10 years, who knows? So maybe in the coming years, we had four hundred thousand dollars for a budget, which is less than we just appropriated for the police. I think that we're getting over our again the head of our skis to 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 try and influence the number of for the capacity. It's just I think we could say as a committee, obviously, we're you know we worry about dollars. This is potentially could have some impact. It's not going to have an enormous impact again based on your model. So uh, that's kind of where I stand. I just can't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't support Al's statement even. And and even like publicizing your message, like as part of the finance committee dis discussion, Al, you know, it, that even makes me nervous also because it's just hard to accept exactly what the numbers are. If it's four million, if it's three million. It, it's just. It's not twenty five million. It's, it's the scale is just not like so severe that we need to make a significant pronouncement without. Qual quantify, uh, qualifying it. Okay, last, last few comments or questions. Jordan and then Al Jones. Jordan? Uh, I, was just, I was just waiting. I thought I was. Uh, we were voting on the motion, so I, I have nothing to add at the moment. Okay, Al Jones. Well, I was only going to respond to Josh that uh, it makes you feel better. I think that if this slide that was presented at the town meeting that it, it would be adjusted to reflect the ARB's recommendation, which is probably half of 15%. You know, I think we can do the same, you know, it's the same calculations, you get the same result. It ends up with 1.8, 1.9 million dollars. But it wouldn't be, I mean, you're right, sometimes extreme numbers like 20,000 get out there and they stick, you know, and we, we don't want to do that for sure. So, so again, it would be like 1.9 if that happened over 10 years. At the end of 10 years, we'd have that in $2 million right. Increase. I mean, I think, I think to me, the, the important point, and this is where I disagree with Annie and Jennifer, is that increased population density will have a negative impact on the structural deficit. The slope is negative. We can argue about the exact slope, but it's always going to be negative. All right. Dean. So I'm going to take Alan's last things point out where this is where this analysis becomes incredibly difficult. Why I don't think we should take a position. Okay. I was thinking it's like ninth grader and eighth grader, like right, because they're gonna become adults and if they want to live in Arlington, car market just a five million dollar house. Right? Because that's us just go for. It. Right? So if you said to me, you said to my kids, you were like, look, here's what we do. We're gonna spend the cost of housing. We're gonna add a ton. Housing's not gonna go up, but you have to pay two thousand dollars more a year in taxes. So you're not going to buy a million five house. You're going to bend it in a million. Save 500000 on your home acquisition. You're going to pay two grand a year for 40 years. So do you want to pay five hundred grand or eighty grand? Now the math in the deck would say you want to pay five hundred grand, right? You don't want to pay eighty grand because five hundred cheaper than eighty. But it's not, right? And that's where this topic becomes incredibly complicated. And we're just out there looking at our own interests, and we're not looking down the road and we're gonna look silly long-term. And that's where I'm concerned is because no one factored in. We heard too, that's one thing we didn't factor in. How does the cost curve bend on housing if all the communities follow through? How does that weigh in cash flow? Because though we like to talk about home values is important, 
I've said a long time when we talk about overrides, home values matter for your heirs, right? When I'm dead and my kids sell my house, that matters, right? But it doesn't matter for me. <coughs> so, there you go. All right. All right. So, so we have two motions before us. Um, the El Tosti motion and then the Daryl Harmer motion. I'll take Al's first. We'll have a roll call vote. Does anyone have any question about what it is that we are voting on? Yeah. Would, would you mind just reading it for me, please? You have it down the <laughs> Recommend to recommend that town meeting vote to accept the minimum required numbers as required by the state until further information is gathered, i.e. approve the lowest available number as required by state law. I don't think that's the most recent. No, it's the check it most conservative number presented ah. to town meeting. Yeah. I bet the most, yeah, I the most the minimum, a minimum, the minimum, the minimum recommends the minimum, the most, most conservative available number consistent with the requirements of state law. Right. Is that right, Al? Uh, yeah, I, I I said, you know, we're not necessarily requiring the minimum number. We're requiring the lowest available. We're recommending the town meeting approve the lowest available number consistent with the requirements of state law. Available to town meeting after motions and amendments. Correct, Al? Whatever the lowest available number the town meeting has in front of them consistent Correct. with state law. So the ARB makes a recommendation, let's say it's 3,500 units, somebody amends that to bring it down to 2,500 units. Our statement would be, you should vote for the amendment to the main motion and get the number down. Be the That's just what you're saying. Yes. 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 Okay, just wanna make it practical for everybody. All right, is everyone ready to vote? Yes. All right. All right, Jordan. I vote yay no. Or nay. Shane. No. Jennifer. No. Sophie. No. Brian's not here. Carolyn's not here. Rebecca. No. Josh. No. Grant. No. Charlie. Abstain. John's not here. Daryl. No. Annie. No. Al Jones. Yes. Sofa. Yes. Peggy is not here. Al Tosti. Yes. Dean. No. Dave. No. Eleven no's. One abstention. <clears throat> and three yes. We have Tara. Yes. Okay, so that motion fails. Next is Daryl's motion of taking no position. Does everyone understand what we're voting on? Did, didn't we just do that? No. No, no we just no, voted totally no, not All right. So, Jordan. Yes. Shane. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Sophie. No. Brian's not here. Carolyn's not here. Rebecca? Yes. Josh? Yes. Grant? Yes. Charlie? No. John's not here. Daryl? Yes. Annie? Yes. Al Jones? No. Topher? No. Peggy's not here. Al Tosti? Al Tosti? No. Dean? Yes. Uh, Dave. Yes. I have 10 in the affirmative, five in the negative. Yep. So that motion passed. 
So the finance committee will take no position on the zoning articles. And I will be prepared to say why, which is essentially, um, we don't have sufficient data to make a recommendation in good faith to tell me. All right, um, all right, that is done. How about whipping off minutes? Which minutes have we got, Carol? So we have um, we have um, June twenty sixth of um, earlier this year. So this is where um, Ida and Alex came in for the end of year transfers, and there was also the elastic clause, and then the update on summer projects and working groups. I forgot we had some projects and working <laughs> groups. All right. Oops. Have people <laughs> have people reviewed the minutes? Are we ready to vote on them? Uh, move approval. Is there a second? Second. All right. Take a vote. Jordan. Abstain. Shane. Yes. Jennifer. Uh, yes. Sophie? Abstain. Ryan, Rebecca? Yes. Josh? Abstain. Grant? Oh, yes. Charlie? Yes. Daryl? Yes. Annie? Yes. L. Jones? Yes. Topher? Yes. L. Tossi? Yes. Dean? Abstain. Dave? Yes. Four extensions and one, two, eleven in the number. Yeah. Minutes are approved. Now for the minutes of September twenty eighth. Any revisions? Changes to that. Move we'll approval. Second. Second. All right. Jordan. Yes. Shane. Uh, abstain. Jennifer. Yes. Sophie. Yes. yes. Uh, Rebecca. Yes. Josh. Yes. Grant. Yes. Charlie. Yes. Uh, Daryl? Yes. Annie? Yes. Al Jones? Yes. Topher? Yes. Al Tosti? Yes. Dean? Yes. Dave? Abstain. Two abstentions and 13 yeses. The minutes have been approved. All right. Does anyone have anything else? All right, I will hope to get out a report um, very quickly uh, so we can get that to town meeting. Let's plan, everyone should plan on meeting at 7.30 before town meeting, the first night of town meeting, which is the 17th, Tuesday the 17th. Um, and we'll talk about whether we need to meet again um, while town meeting is in session. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Shane went through a good night, so I have to stay with us. Yeah, you know.